So I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, one of the things we're still working on, it's going to be a continuous thing all the way through, is uh, our primary goal is to live a life as free of all the negative things that hit us <coughs> so powerfully and will for the rest of our lives. All right. So how do we cope with that? How do we stay ahead of it? How do we engineer in the way that Paul said to live fearlessly, courageously, and guilt-free, okay? And so that is our goal, and that is a process that we're going through, and each one of them. The first lesson was how do you love, all right? Jesus command the love, and what was the definition he used? Do you remember what the definition of love that he talked about? Love like, like, love like I do? Just the way I've done it. Oh, you saw me, you watched me, do it just like I did it, okay? And then we talked about the two kinds of love, and there were two circles. Remember the two circles? What are the two kinds of love? Unconditional and conditional. It takes both to have a healthy mind. You cannot be healthy if you don't have, if you haven't been exposed to both. So if you were given no conditional love, you want my approval, you're going to come up without having any standards or any, um, you haven't learned the lessons of how to behave and how to get along. If you've had a, a conditional love and you haven't been exposed to an ongoing, permanent, no limits kind of love, I'll accept whatever you are, whoever you are, then you can't have the, the peace that comes with Sometimes we just don't know whether somebody cares about us or not. So that's a part of it then. And then we talked about how um, we have different needs. And the conditional love is what helps us to teach and learn each other, teach each other and learn from each other what the other needs. And you remember how there are different needs, both for the men and for the women? <coughs> you remember what the, the deepest fear of the men is? You're close. Really, really, you're really in the in the ballpark there. Having died without anyone respecting or appreciating or approving of them, without honor, without respect. Okay? And if you lived your whole life and you come to the end and no one has said, Wow, what a guy, what a what a blessing, then you're gonna feel like you have your worst fear, okay? Uh, what's the lady's deepest fear? Remember? Kind of important to kind of remember these back, back and forth over mm -hmm. Fear of being abandoned, unloved, isolated, cut off, possibly used, potentially abused, without having a partner, without having someone who cares for them unconditionally, um, and ultimately to be left alone. alone. Okay? So, in, in one sense, they both have the same fear, isolation. Why is solitary confinement the worst punishment you can give someone in our penal system? It's the thing we fear the worst. Is there anybody in there who cares whether you're alive or dead? No. Does anybody respect you? No. Does anybody care whether you live? Solitary confinement is the worst possible punishment because it hits at our deepest fear at every level. Okay, now. I'm going to tell you a story, and it's a true one. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather, Art and Elma White, <laughs> Art and Elma White fought and argued every 
day of their lives. They raged at each other. They're good Christian people. Gideons, lifelong Gideons, uh, wonderful uh, leaders in the church, dedicated followers of Jesus Christ. But they would scream at each other with these enormous, angry, scary, cords in the neck, thumping veins, jumping up and down, screaming matches. Okay? And they never understood why. They couldn't figure out why. They just, I mean, it was never violent, there was never any threat, but they would just get so angry at each other. Well, one of the things that I made up my mind to do I ain't never going to live that way. Never. And try to figure out what is happening in that animal and why people get into that. And what I discovered was a very simple fact. Inside of every person, there are three individuals. And they appear and disappear somewhat randomly. They each have their own qualities, their own identities, but you never know which one's going to show up, okay? And what happens is, uh, <laughs> one will hook the other one, the phrase I it will hook the other one, and the tug of war starts. It's almost like the starting pistol goes off and the contest just goes on, all right? And if you don't have some way of figuring out how to put the brakes on that and how to cope with that, you will repeat the same arguments over and over and over again. Go back over some of the arguments you might have had with your brothers and sisters, not in this room, but, you know. And you'll find the same arguments will happen again and again and again. Okay. So why does it happen? Well, here's the key. Your brain is a most incredible machine, all right? It is the most sophisticated recording instrument ever devised in this world. It records everything. And it will play back anything, sometimes randomly. Okay? And it has not only a color track in the video, not black and white, it's color. Not only does it have a sound track, it has a track for every one of your senses plus your emotions. You can actually relive every moment of your life. It's recorded. Now, how do we know that? He said, Pastor Brown, come on, recording all that stuff? I'd have to have a library of, you know, memory chips to try and record all that. No, it's all there. And the reason we say that is because when people have brain surgery, for whatever reason they need to go in there, doctors will take very tiny, very low voltage probes and touch certain parts of the cortex of the brain. And the people, normally in brain surgery, you're not put completely under. They want to see what they're not, what's happening and, and what you're responding. So they give you sort of a, a local, but you're able to stay conscious, okay? And people will tell what they're experiencing as though it was happening in that moment right then. Had they remembered it? Most of them don't remember it. They've never had any memory of that event, but they will have the same thoughts, they will have the same feelings, they will have the same fears, they'll have all of the same, they'll smell the smells. Whether it's cookies baking in mama's kitchen or whether you're just terrified, okay? And it comes with a complete set. Every track is recorded. Right? Now, what that does for us is several things. It helps us to understand 
why we respond sometimes in the most incredible ways. Unexpected ways. Sometimes scary ways. Have you heard the word PS, post-traumatic stress syndrome? PTSD? PTSD. PTSD. You know what that is? It's recordings. It's nothing more than recordings of what you have seen and heard and felt and smelled and and all of a sudden, at an inappropriate time, sometimes in the middle of the night, all of a sudden, one of those will plug in and replay, and then you'll have heart palpitations, and you'll jump up and strike out or whatever else, and it's nothing more than a, a replay of those very same events that you put in there. Now, I say this, now this is kind of off to the side. This, this is for free, and you don't take it very seriously, so just kind of write it off. It scares me when I see people spending hours and hours and hours pretending to shoot individuals on a TV screen and pretend, but they get just as excited, they get just as juiced up, they get just as worked up, they have the same kind of feelings, and if that gets recorded and comes back at an inappropriate time, it can cause all kinds of difficulties because what you put in is stored. So why does this incredible recorder that we have in our heads, shouldn't that be a good thing? Don't we remember? Isn't that a good thing? Well, yeah, it's how we associate ourselves. It's, it's how we fit into our world. Let me give you one silly example. And, and it kind of still impacts something what's going on. Um, my daughter was expecting my first granddaughter. And it was something to really look forward to. I was having fun getting ready. And so when Reagan was born, uh, she had to go in the neonatal neo unit for a little while because she'd um, gone just a little bit past due. And they needed to look after her a little bit. But then she came home. Now, in their home, they have, they had two great big dogs. One was a giant boxer, and the other one was a mutt that they had actually gotten so that Titus, the bulldog, would have a chew toy to work on. And <laughs> these dogs would just go crazy. I mean, they were barking and wrestling and having so much fun. Then nothing ever, no blood, never did anything damage. But they would just bark and holler and scream at each other and roll around on the floor. So I'm thinking, oh man, what's going to happen when little Reagan, the baby, comes home to all that mess, all that noise and chaos and everything. So I'm holding her very carefully, and the dogs come in for the first time. And they are looking forward to having fun, and they start wrestling on the floor, and they're chewing on each other's ears, and you know, all the things that they did, making a huge, amazing amount of noise. And Reagan didn't even bat an eye. Not the slightest indication of the noise, the harshness of the barks, nothing. Why? If you came back into that room, you'd be shocked. First time you walked in there. She'd already been listening to it for all these months. It was a normal way of life. Now what that means is, her little recorder had already given her enough basic information. She didn't have to worry about that. That was normally the way life sounds. Okay? If that little baby, on the first visit she had home, had recorded enough material in utero, <laughs> think of all the things that's already recorded. Sounds of voices of mom and dad, hopefully grandma and grandpa too, you know, all the different things are all put away in that tight package. I know music so much. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, and we continue. Well, my oldest son, uh, Jonathan, we didn't have any money back in those days, so we bought an old beat-up crib. 
And it was a nasty thing. It was a terrible looking thing. But Judy and I spent many, many hours going through and painting every one of the slats in that baby bed a different bright primary color. Just so that every single minute that Jonathan, or whatever the baby's name was at that point, because we didn't do ultrasounds back in those days, or we had no idea. So every time the baby would open its eyes, there'd be this flash of bright and brilliant colors. Visual stimulation. He works for Regal Cinemas showing movies with m sound and light and it, it, it was a profound memory. It goes all the way back. I feel like I even have my birth memory. I suffered for many, many years with a dream that's, that looked to me as I look back on it later as my birth event. You would say but you weren't able to remember anything back there. Oh, yeah? Yeah, you do. And somehow, that was a very scary event for me. I didn't blame my mother for it or anything. It was not that, but... <laughs> but we do have... Now, here's the reason why that's interesting. Because through all the pre-verbal years, and all the years that you're, you're listening to, actually, vocabulary is almost entirely nothing more than replaying recordings you've heard of sounds and combinations of sounds. If you want to prepare your child for multi-language skills, play a lot of different languages, uh, tapes and things, so that they can feed all that into their computer, into their tape recorder, to try and get as much of that familiar sound as possible. There's no time you will learn language any faster than in that infancy period. There's a film full of all kinds of ling linguistic sounds. All right, so, but there's no judgment. Now, I'm going to draw you a picture. Here's this little tiny baby, six months old, sitting on the floor watching what's happening. And mom is out of her mind. She just dropped the supper preparation she made on the floor. She's afraid the child will get into that hot soup or whatever she's been fixing. And everything that she's been working on is ruined. Okay, you got the picture? What does it sound like? There's hysteria going on. <laughs> and she's grabbing the child and setting it farther away. No, no, touch this. No, 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 no. Now, if you were going to record that, I just did. and then you say, oh, yeah, you, I guess you did. <laughs> <laughs> Except it would have been a much higher voice. Um, did your mind say, well, mom's having a bad day, and she's scared I'll get into some hot soup on the floor, and she only has 10 minutes until Grandma Judy comes and sees the mess, and she's going to be all upset because there's no judgment. There's no way of parsing that to figure out what's actually happening. All they did was record it. Okay? And so, when we actually go backwards and say, how do things happen? Did any of you watch, uh, I can only imagine, have you, have you seen, oh, I can only imagine? Just the trailer. Just the trailer. Okay. We have the video. And what that's a story of is a young man who writes, I can only imagine, is an abused child. Okay? His father beat him unmercifully. He was a drunk and terrible. And it was awful. And it was a story of a very, very terribly abused childhood. The whole family was dysfunctional. All right? Now, he starts going to church. He starts involved, getting involved in Christian music. But he's got all this stuff, all this <laughs> stuff <laughs> from before. And he doesn't know how to relate to God, and he's still trying to figure out how, to, how this Jesus thing works. And he's trying to go to church, he's trying to be involved in Christian music, and he's trying to start this group. 
and all of this thing happens, and finally he, he can't, nobody can understand why he is freaking out all the time, why he just goes crazy periodically. And finally he stops, and he decides, I have to figure out my own life, my own heart first, before I can go forward. And so he goes back home and reconciles with his father. Now, I haven't ruined the story for you. There's a lot more to it than that. But that's the overarching framework. That's why I kind of suggested either that you watch it before or watch it afterwards, because what's happening is all this stuff that's recorded back here, we have to find a way to deal with it in a creative and productive way. So you actually have three people inside of you. You have two that come automatically. One is called the parent. And if you look at your little chart there, you'll see that the parent has a whole lot of both verbal and nonverbal kinds of keys. If I stand here and I go like this, and I put a scowl on my face, <laughs> what do you feel just looking at me? Fear. I must have done something really bad or something. Because the parent automatically hooks the child. What, what child ever thinks that a parent got upset for any other reason than it said they did something wrong? It just doesn't happen. Okay. So the parent has all these nonverbal clues and keys and, and little indicators. My children practiced for years to get the snap down. Do you have anyone in your family that snaps? No, you gotta work on it, Joe Ben. It has to be really, really powerful. Mine's kind of a bass snap, all right? Because when we went into a store, I didn't want to yell, Jonathan! Angela, come here! All I had to do was go, and wherever they had gone, their heads would come around from the other <laughs> eye. And they go, what did I do now? That was my mom's whistle. <laughs> the whistle. That's another one. The, the Miller family next door was a pastor's family in the Baptist church. And the, and the Millers used a dog whistle. I thought that was a little crude, but that, that worked for them. Mom, the mom whistle's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> but my son... I mean, he had his kids first, so I have the oldest grandson from my youngest son. He worked for years to get that snap down so he could use that for his kids. Okay? Nonverbal, didn't say anything. But it's so select because even from the pulpit, when I see three kids misbehaving in the back pew, I can be preaching along, hit that click, and not miss a single word in a sentence, and three heads will pop up going, we're in trouble now. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll just snap at you. We'll see what happens. I'm so out of practice, I got a crave in my snap message. finger. <laughs> <laughs> but the parent, the parent, you have to understand this is not with judgment. This is, and I'm not saying your parent was bad or your parent was angry or your parent was negative in any way. The parent is that part of you that recorded what you heard and what you experienced, what you felt. Okay? And so the parent is controlling. It is dictatorial. It has to be in control at every single minute. It, it's its job description. My kids think I had a stroke about 1992 because they all basically left the house and I stopped being the parent that they remembered. <laughs> That's okay. They tell their kids, this is not the man I grew up with. This is not the person that I lived with for all those 18, 19 years. He's completely different. Why? My job was done. They'd heard every one of my sermons, every one of my lectures. I, I couldn't tell them another new thing. Or bet. Now you're on your own. You do what you want with it. 
<laughs> and I can smile, I can relax, I can laugh. But up to that point, how it do I see the pictures of me, the videos from back in those days. This is a guy not having much fun. Yeah. The parent has to be in control. Now, what does that mean that the child is doing? Trying to get away with anything they can. Because the child is born a selfish, an amazing creature that has no compassion or interest in anyone else's needs and completely obsessed with its own. I think that's what some of the writers in the scripture called our sinful human nature. Because we just don't care. We want what we want, and we want it right now. We don't want to wait. We don't have to work for it. We don't have any desire. I, I was going to start this evening with Romans 7. Paul writes in there, I can't understand what's happening to myself. I have all these things I really want to do. I have all these things that I know are right to do, and the very things that I know are right to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, well, that's what I end up doing. And it seems like every single time I figure out what I really should be doing, suddenly I find that I'm not doing it, and I'm doing what I don't want to do instead. Oh, what a wretched man I am. Super confusing passage. What was that? It's a, it's a really confusing passage if you read it. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. He's actually describing this. See these arrows back and forth over here? I don't know if you can see them or not. That's that dynamic back and forth that we get into. We get hooked from parent to child, child to parent, back and forth all the time. It's a great tug of war. And Paul's actually defining what it's like to have this push-pull of the things inside of him that he knows. He said, I know the rules are right. I know what I've got. The, the law by itself is good. It's not that it's... But I don't live up to the law, the thing that I would love to be able to. I don't do Romans 7 is a great passage that talks about exactly what we're showing right here. Okay? Here's the problem, my friends. The parent, that part of us we re that holds, that tries to hold control, can <coughs> not love. Now that's the problem. <coughs> not that, I didn't say your parents didn't love. What you recorded in your head can't love. It's obsessed with control. It can't stop for a minute wondering if somebody's not sneaking off and doing something they shouldn't. It's called a guilty conscience, if you want to put it that way. Because it's always reminding us, oh, wait a minute, you didn't do what you said. Remember that promise that you made? You were supposed to do such and such. You, you, you told somebody you'd be there at 7, and you were there you know, 745. My very first date, I was 45 minutes late in my very first date. Can you imagine? Whew. And she's still married. <laughs> You're a lucky man. I wonder if you've been there still. <laughs> no. When you make that your parent is saying, look, now I wasn't driving. I was riding in the back seat of my friend's car, and it was brand new, and it said you had to go 45 miles an hour and or you ruined the engine. That was back in the 60s. Corvair. I mean, come on. Oh. So anyway, <clears throat> it was a great car. Uh, but he drove according to the book and I was passionate to get there and it, it, it didn't work out very well. In the end it worked out fine, but that particular day was a, was a disaster. Okay. So the parent is always pushing you. They're never going to forgive you. You're never going to get past this. They're going to hold this over your head for the rest of your lives. The whole thing with the parent will not love. It will not give you any reinforcement or love. The problem is the child has the same problem. It wants what it wants, and it wants it right now, and it can't love. It cannot look at your needs and say, well, right now, you need my attention more than I need my attention, so I'll not take the center stage. I'll let you, your needs be first. Child can't love. 
<laughs> so that means we're really stuck. We're two of the three parts of who we are. Don't love. And not love. Can't love. Incapable of love. And then we come to the third, which is, it doesn't show up until, you know, between 8 and 12, somewhere in there. It's called the age of accountability. We've kind of spoken to that different times, and we refer to it once in a while. And what it is, it's the first time when we look at our lives, we look at ourselves, we look at the parents and the grandparents and our friends, and we look at them and say, they probably should have done that better. Or I should have done that better. And it's like an objective. The, 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 the parent and the child I put over top of each other because the tug of war is who's going to be on top today. All right? I put the adult off to the side for one reason. It kind of looks and says, you know, that was pretty childish. That didn't come up to your normal standards. You know, you really kind of let your parent off the chain. So eventually, you, you get this point in your life where you begin to say, I love my mother, I love my father, but they are not perfect people. And all of a sudden you can begin to start doing some evaluation. And you get yourself and you can start doing some evaluation. The adult is one that asks all kinds of questions. It's inquisitive. It's hungry for information and knowledge. It is, it is the one that can balance both the good and the bad. And you can evaluate and you can start to say, okay, now, that was not all good, but it was a lot more good than it was bad. All right? And when I was raising my kids, I, I wanted that adult to grow as quickly as possible. Because it, it starts off at zero, all right, in size. So when they would do something as uh, four or five, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, I would set them down at the table and say, okay, now, I want you to give me four reasons why hitting your sister during the argument was a bad thing to do. Okay, Kyle, I thought I was going to say good reasons. Yeah. <laughs> well, instead of just telling them and preaching to them over and over the same message, it makes her cry and it makes her feel bad and you you know you broken one of her front teeth or whatever the thing was and you, you go through this whole list of things that you can tell them over and over and over again it kind of just goes through and out so what i made them do is tell me why what they did was bad hurtful inappropriate we're just plain wrong. So that, oh, I can't think of any more. Oh. Yeah. How about it was difficult to clean up all the blood that from her bloody nose? Ooh. You know, there was a problem. You caused mom to spend the whole afternoon washing laundry from. Oh, well, yeah, that's another one. Okay. <laughs> you, you see, once you start making that person responsible to come up with the reasons why, then all of a sudden something miraculous starts to happen. The adult begins to grow. The adult will only grow if it's nourished, if it's fed, if it is encouraged. Okay? Um, strange story. I'll just give it to you and then I'll just explain why. My oldest son was a tester. He tested every limit that we ever gave him. And so we had a mobile home back in those days when I was in college. And he was just a, a floor crawler. Broke back. And we also had a cat. To have a cat, you have to have a cat box. The oh toddler and the cat box were in the same room. You could oh, have any other rooms, oh. right? So right by the front door, we had this gray rug. It was a walk-off rug. You, know, you could track stuff in on your shoes and you could wipe them off right there on the rug. So what we did is we put the cat box on the back side of the rug from the rest of the room. 
And the rule was, for Jonathan, you can't get on the rug. Well, if you can't get on the rug, you can't get to the cat box. See, it's a nice, logical, reasonable way of doing things, okay? So, Jonathan, and a rug rat, would go over, and he'd sit next to the rug. He'd look at me studying my books over on the sofa. And, you know, I'd see you. And then he would go. <laughs> <laughs> and put his hand on the rug. I snapped that man with me. <laughs> and then I'd make it, pick him up, move him over to the other, other side of the room, pretty soon he'd be back over there, looking at me to see if I. <laughs> and if I didn't catch it, he'd be over and have his hand down on the kitty litter. Oh. Okay? <laughs> Happened many, 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 many times. I'm studying for my accounting degree. I've got all this stuff. I'm trying to get my thoughts together. When I'm working on my desk, I'm turned around backwards, so I can't even observe him. I can't do the I'm always watching you kind of thing. Just constantly snap. <laughs> <laughs> One day, I caught him with his hand in the cat box. <laughs> and I went wrenching over and I grabbed the hold of him and I jerked him back out of there and I said these words If I ever catch you doing that again, I'm going to nail your hide to the wall. <laughs> and it was quiet for a second. And he said, when can I get down? <laughs> That's amazing. And I thought to myself, what does that mean? <laughs> I never said that before in my life. <laughs> Where in the world did that come from? So I asked my dad. I mean, he said it all the time. I, he said, well, back in the days, back on the farm, when we shot a hog or a deer or whatever, we would skin it out, we'd take the carcass over to the old barn site, we'd nail it up, keep it stretched out flat, so when the guys came through, they're going to do the tanning and things, it was all stretched out, it wouldn't be all wrinkled up and nasty, and they wouldn't have to soak it so much, and so they paid us better if it was nice and flat, we'd nail the hides to the wall. Did I ever nail the hide to the wall? Did I even know what they were doing? No! It was an old tape. What I'm trying to get to is if your adult isn't right up in power, your brain will default back to putting an old tape in in an inappropriate way and slide it right back into your consciousness. And the words came out that I had never uttered before in my life. I'm going to nail your hide to the wall. I never did. <laughs> <laughs> but I've used the expression several times since just for effect. <laughs> Okay? Now, if, for instance, let's just go backwards and say, okay, this uh, story of uh, an abused uh, family. If, he, if the father took you back to the garage or some outbuilding and abused you, hit you numerous times, and now as an adult, every time I go past one of these garages that looks half abandoned, my heart rate picks up a beat, and I start going, oh, man, why am I sweating all of a sudden? You know what's happened? You understand? Your brain, when it's really not having any other conscious control, pulls an old tape out and plugs it in, and you relive the experience at some level. Now, just stop and think about what a complicated this situation is. Let's just pretend someone is abused or sexually molested by someone that they love in their family. Every one of the tracks is all the way turned up to the max. You've got fear, you've got hurt, you've got sensations of excitement, you've got shame, you've got anger, and every one of the tracks is playing at full blast. Okay? And now, 20 years later, you're wondering why every time you go out to dinner, 
you go into cold sweats because you can't understand why you have so many mixed feelings about the fact that you're having a good time together with your spouse. Because all of a sudden something is plugging back in in a powerful way. It is very, very difficult. We had a pastor back in um, Florida. And a great pastor, great teaching pastor. Oh, it was incredible. And his wife and his two daughters sat on the front row every Sunday. And she just kept getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Just kept getting more and more shriveled up. I mean, she just kept, she was fading away right in front of our eyes. And they tried to get help, they tried to get counseling, they tried to get nutritionists, they tried all these different things to find what was happening. Finally, they said, we're so desperate, we're going to take a three-month sabbatical, and we're going to go do a, a live-in intensive counseling in some place in Texas or Arkansas, or in Arizona, some kind of Texas. They walked into that in-house, long-term, residential care program, sat down in the counselor's office, and inside of 15 minutes, turned to the pastor's wife and said, who was it in your family who abused you? And of course, the pastor's like, oh, you sure made a mistake with that one. You know, there's no way that anything like that happened. And almost under her voice, under her breath, she said it with my father. And I've never said it out loud to anybody. Nobody knows. First time it ever happened that I spoke about it. Now, I want you to understand. When we talk about this, it's not just two people who've been married over 50 years screaming at each other like my grandparents did. It's some of the most complex issues in relationships you're ever going to run into. And you don't know what somebody else is dealing with. They've been married over 20 years. They had grown kids. He didn't know. He had to change his profession. He couldn't continue to pastor anymore. Why? Because his primary responsibility is to take care of his family. And with her sitting in the front row every single Sunday with this tremendous guilt, with this great, big, huge, amazing, that, that that parent is just driving her crazy. You have no right to sit here in this church as someone that they should be looking at or modeling after because you are a wretch. Just pounding on her week after week after week after week. You are a sham. You're a fraud. You are evil. Now, what I'm saying to this to you because sometime in your future, in all likelihood, you will want to go to the front of an altar or someplace and look at someone you love very, very much and say, until death do us part. Be aware. It could get real interesting. Because you don't know what's buried back here. They don't even know what's buried back here. They don't know what's hiding underneath that only comes out in the middle of the night when you're really, really stressed out about things. But this is our hope. This is what makes all of the other stuff possible. And here's the reason why. Jesus Christ never, ever scolded somebody like they were a child. He always spoke to them as an adult. Because he was building this 
Well, I guess he did quote Peter one time saying, get behind me, saying, no, I'll take that one exception. All right? But he was always coaxing out the adult. You read anything he taught in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew, the Sermon on the Plain, in, in um, Luke, you, you find any of the parables, you find any of the things he keeps teasing out of you. Come on. The parable of the sower. I'll tell you, but you have to think about it. You have to come up with what you think that stony ground is. You have to think about what that weedy ground is. Come on, think about what it's like to be one that puts, throws the seed out on the path. And it look, it's good seed. I paid for that. The seed that I threw on the path could have fed my family another meal. And now it's just gone. Wasted. Jesus was always coaxing out the adult. Every Sunday school class, every 2020 group, ought to be putting a little more information inside the adult. And just like an expanding balloon, it should become more and more beautiful and robust and stronger and more vibrant and more alive and more in control because you absolutely have to have all three parts of you in order to be a healthy person. You have to have a healthy parent because every so often you're going to think about doing something that's really <laughs> wrong. <laughs> really wrong. Really wrong. And the parents are going to say, oh, uh, didn't you learn anything? My uh, oldest son speeds. At least he used to. And so one of the things I told him is my responsibility as parent is you have to pay every speeding ticket yourself. I am not paying for anything. I'm not paying for the increased insurance. I'm not paying for nothing. And if you make a mistake and you bang up the car, you have to pay for that too. Because I'm not turning into my insurance. And so after his first meeting ticket, he said, I have a $156 ticket I have to pay. I said, that's good. Better get a job. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a church camp close by. And they didn't have any real paying jobs or anything. But they did need somebody washing dishes. And so he washed dishes, and he washed dishes and as long, as many different days, as many hours as he possibly could get, because he had to pay that, and there was a certain deadline, and it had to be done. And he got within about a week of it, of the deadline, and he said, Dad, one of my buddies will loan me the money I need to finish this up. Can I borrow it from him? I know, absolutely not. The only money that you've been allowed to pay on that is your own cash money. No loans, no nothing. It has to be your stuff. There was a lot of overtime that week. But he paid. And I thought, now that'll be a lesson he'll learn, he'll remember. But you know, he kept paying. <laughs> he just kept paying. <laughs> it took a long while for him to figure out that's a painful way to live. Now, what is it that he's telling his four children? Don't speak. <laughs> you break the rules, you pay the price. You're just going to do it the same way. He's absolutely preaching exactly the same sermon that I did all through the years. Because, why? Because eventually it's this that will make most of your decisions. And it will be this that actually moderates all the rest of you. You want the parent. You have to have a parent. When you go to... Six Flags in Texas, or you go to Cedar Point in Ohio, or Disney World, or whatever, don't take the parent with you. I don't care who you go with. Make a rule before you walk through the gate. Give your parent the day off. I'm going to eat all the junk food I want to, because I'm going to have my child completely set free, 
Don't criticize me because I didn't put on enough sunscreen. I'm going to enjoy being out in the sun no matter what. Okay? And the child is just set free. And it's really very important. When I go out on a date with my wife, we have an agreement. No parents here. But. You don't want a child there either. Well, you have to take my adult. I have to take yeah, my adult. Exactly. Because there, there's a certain point at which you have to say, now I'm not scolding, but you know, you might want to wear that hat. The sun out there is really, really bright right now, or whatever it might be. The, the adult takes the place of the most critical part of the, the part of you that, that doesn't know how to love. And it doesn't look down or condemn or demean. It just helps you cope. And so as we're talking about this, this parent, adult, child, the child will hook the parent in, in a long-term relationship. I mean, friendships. I, I had hoped you came back from Florida with all kinds of wonderful stories about arguments that you had and all kinds of things. <laughs> and you went into, oh, I can't stand that music anymore. Why don't you turn it off? I'm making it all up. I'm making it up. Because no matter who you are and what your relationship is, I could be with your boss, it could be with a co-worker, he will all, he, he, she, will always act the part of the child. And what's the automatic response? You ought to straighten out your life. You're just in up one more mess and one after one right after the other. All right? My wife is a wonderful parent. <laughs> All right? She defaults to the parent every time that her mind goes a little dark. And, and what she does is she tries to control all the children in her life. Now, that makes her a wonderful administrative assistant in a CPA firm. It's an odd thought when you think about your wife mm -hmm. being feared. Mm -hmm. She <laughs> is a boot camp surgeon. I don't doubt it. I just haven't seen it yet. So. <laughs> right. Now, I love it because I need that same kind of guidance. But sometimes she goes too far, and I have to come back and say, okay, I am not unworthy of respect, approval, remember the men's female sphere, all right? I can make some of these decisions on my own. I don't have to have you supervise. When she asked me the same question for the sixth time, what does that mean to you? She's really trying to make sure she gets the right answer, or she doesn't trust you. Depends on how I'm feeling. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it depends completely on how I'm feeling. All right? Because if I'm feeling fine, I'll answer it the sixth time and keep right on going. When I'm feeling a little defensive, or when my child kicks up, pull an old tape out, plug it in, and then we have, well, a pastor friend of mine in Indiana calls it the crazy time, all right? It's when we're not really in control of the whole situation, and we kind of put ourselves on autopilot, and we're having the same argument for the third or fourth time this week, okay? And he kind of refers to what we've, we've started in the crazy time again, haven't we? Yeah. Okay, now, parent, adult, child. The adult is the one who can actually figure out what the best solution is to take care of things. It's hungry to know all the possibilities and to try and get a balanced view of the world and how to respond to it. It really wants to ask a lot more questions, like, why is that so important to you? Is there is there something else going on right now? Is there is there anything I can do to help put your mind at ease? Is there something I need to listen to? Okay, the adult is the one that every sermon is pointed directly at. Every message is to try and blow up and expand the importance and the vitality of that adult area of each person. Here's the problem. It can also ex it can also deflate. 
if you're going through a financial crisis, if you're going through a uh, marital crisis, if you're going through a physical crisis where you have someone in your family who's sick and is struggling, if you're going through one of those times in your life when everything seems to be coming apart, the adult collapses. It deflates, it becomes less powerful. And that's when we have to really realize things can spiral out of hand very, very quickly. I told you we lost a, a niece 30 years old, there was no adult. She had gone raw child, 100% pure child. What's the most important characteristic you can tell me about the child? It doesn't know how to love. It can't forgive. It can't be compassionate. It can't understand. And when you have gone back and by multiple tiny little steps and your adult has gotten shrunken and emaciated, you're left with only the two parts of you that don't know how to understand and care. Okay? That's when life gets very, very dangerous. Um, I, I've gone my limit. I can't do any more. I promised you an hour, and that's been an hour, and I have to stop. End of lesson. Do you have any questions or anything I can help you with? I have taken seriously of you. One lady and her husband were there trying to get ready for their wedding, and she said it the, the most beautiful way. I mean, she, I mean, she kind of was hurt. She said, Pastor Bob, I just feel like you're unnecessarily pessimistic. You just, <laughs> you just seem to think that there's always going to be problems. I can't understand this. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm marrying my very best friend. We get along on every level. We're, we're fine. We, you know, please, we've <laughs> talked about all this stuff. It's not going to be an issue. And you just seem to be dwelling on it. <laughs> Well, yeah, you're probably right. I am dwelling on it. I do tend to say the same things over and over. She said, but you don't have to with us because we're not going to need this. <laughs> That's what they all say. <laughs> and they're all... She came back about six months later. She had been attending the church afterwards. She hadn't been involved or anything. But they did come about six months later and they said, Pastor Bob, we somehow have misplaced all those handouts that you gave us. Do <laughs> <laughs> you have that extra any copies any place? <laughs> I'd like to review those and kind of restudy the situation again. And, and I said, sure, we have a lot of, got a lot of copies. How did I know they were going to do that? Gut feeling? They were both divorced. This was their second marriage for both of them. Oh. oh. <laughs> No wonder. No. They had completely blamed the other person in the relationship for all the problems. And now that I'm married to the right person, I don't ever have those problems again. The problem is they brought themselves along into the new relationship. Yeah. Now, I'm not bitter or anything like that. I, I'll work with them. And I, I've said it this way so many different times. I will work with anybody under any circumstance that wants to learn how to love, love better. Live better. Love better. Be better. I don't care what your past is or what you're going through. I can help you do it better. I can help you do it better. And that's what we're here to do. I, I wanted you in the 2020 group to have as many of the nuggets of gold that I have mined out of the life that I can possibly give you so that you have a little packet, a, a little notebook of things that 
You don't have to learn the same painful way I had to learn. I've already dug them out of the hill for you, and you'll have them here that you can use if, if you want. Don't force you to have them. Don't, I don't make you make jewelry out of the little nuggets of gold. It's just, it's there in the little packet, and if you like it, it's cool. If not, it's cool.